Uh, we're lucky to have Howard Richard. Uh, a lot of you know him. He's an interventional radiologist from the University of Maryland. He's been here before. And uh, as, as a lot of you know, Maryland has a shock trauma hospital, so they have a, they're, they're definitely a grade, a level one trauma center. And he's going to tell us how things are going up at Maryland. Howard? Thank you, Bain, for the kind invitation, and uh, John as well for uh, inviting me to speak to you all. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our sort of approach to uh, liver and spleen trauma, and uh, basically the role that we play in uh, helping to manage these patients non-operatively or operatively at the uh, University of Maryland at the Shock Trauma Center. Let's see, this must be the clicker thingy. Okay, so classically, we are talking about trauma, we're talking about injuries. Uh, back in the days uh, before there was angiography, when the patient was injured, the patient went to the operating room, and they opened the patient, they found the area that was bleeding, and they, they sort of tied it until it, it stopped bleeding. Um, the concept of non-operative management uh, was sort of born by the, the fact that some of these patients could be observed and you can watch them and, and realize that some of these patients will survive without an operation. Um, when we managed to have the uh, option or the ability to do embolization, we were able to sort of augment the group of patients that could be managed successfully without an operation. So. Uh, at our, our institution, we have some protocols in place that sort of drive uh, the indications for patients to go to angiography. I'm going to talk a little bit about the when, the where, and how we do uh, angiography when we do take a patient to angiography. And we'll talk briefly about the sort of the success rates and the complications. So first, we'll start talking about the liver. So. About half of patients, uh, or, or up to 9% of patients, depending on who you ask or who you look at, are going to be candidates for uh, non-operative management. And by that, I mean that these are patients that present either stable or they respond to a fluid challenge with a period of stability. Now, that period of stability allows the patient to undergo a CT scan. And once they have a CT scan, then they can have their injury A diagnosed and B graded. And this is the, the liver grading schema, and I put it up there. I know it's really busy just to sort of say that it's a little complicated. But nonetheless, if the patients are stable at admission, they get screening CT scan. If they are uh, continuing to be stable, then they go into the non-operative management group. If their patients are unstable, then they typically will go to a damage control laparotomy. And some of those patients will continue to bleed or uh, bleed late after that. And so those patients also go into the group of, the, of patients that we will take the angiography. So when we talk about the patients that we do angioembolization on, there's sort of two groups. They're the ones who are, are stable with a high-grade injury seen at CT or the patients that bleed uh, through their operation. So if the patients that that come in and get a CT scan, if they have a high grade lesion, which is a grade four, grade five injury, uh, so multiple lacerations uh, and, and typically a contrast blush, those are patients that we will take to the uh, angiography. Uh, patients that have high injury scores, uh, hypotension, transfusion requirements, these are some of the things that uh, our surgeons will kind of use to kind of tip the scale in sort of the intermediate uh, the grade three patients and determine whether or not those patients need to come to angiography. Now, some patients will go to damage control laparotomy. Those patients will typically get packed. They'll have drains. The surgeons sometimes will call us and say the patients continue to, to bleed. Uh, we're going to bring the patient out of the OR and we want you guys to have your table ready and we'll take those patients straight from the OR with the anesthesiologist in tow. There are other patients they take to damage control laparotomy and those patients will have ongoing bleeding into their drains or they'll have a delayed bleeding or they'll have a CT scan that shows uh, a blush and after maybe two, three days post-op and those patients will take the angiography as well. <clears throat> 
So in terms of the question, we're going to take the patient angiography, we have to sort out, well, when are we going to do it? Uh, if the patient is a grade three and there's sort of soft findings, then we may see those patients in the morning. All other patients that are unstable, and, and typically at, at shock trauma, stable is kind of a misnomer. Um, if, if a patient is unstable, that means the hand of the surgeon is in their belly. If the patient is stable, they're not in the OR yet. So um, if they're unstable, they go to the OR, and, and, and that's the, the thing. If they're relatively stable, then typically we'll see them in an hour or two. So the first thing we do when we're seeing the patients uh, or we get called is we typically try to review the CT scan because they invariably had a CT scan. Um, and that will tell us sort of where we need to go and we'll sort of look at the history. Is this a patient that had blunt trauma? Uh, if they have blunt trauma, you're going to expect multiple areas to be injured. Or is this a patient who has a laceration um, from a stab wound? And, and then you're going to be potentially thinking there's going to be one spot that if we just get that one spot, then we'll be in good shape. Now, in terms of uh, if the patient has had uh, more than, say, 10 units, we're going to have potential for a, a coagulopathy. And those patients may be a little bit more difficult to get control of their hemorrhage. So this is a CT scan which shows uh, a fair amount of blood in the peritoneal space. You have blood on the right, blood on the left, and a big contrast blush. And surprisingly, this patient was stable enough to not go to the operating room. And so this patient was referred for angiography. So first thing we do when we do a hepatic angiography trauma is we do a flush to make sure that we know the road that we need to travel down to get to the area where there's the bleeding. We'll look at the portal venography to make sure that there is flow in the portal vein because when we start talking about taking away the hepatic arterial flow, we would like to know that there's going to be some portal venous flow so that we're uh, understanding our risk for inducing uh, hepatic necrosis. And at diagnostic angiography, once we get out selectively, we're going to look to see if there's extravasation. Um, other reasons why we would do an embolization are going to be for truncation or for shunting. So this is the arteriogram for the patient, which shows the active extravasation. So we go out, I think I'm going backwards now. Well, so once we get, excuse me, once we figure out that we have active extravasation, then we're going to start looking at what are we going to do about it. So when we're looking at uh, liver trauma, typically we're going to use a, a temporary agent like a gel foam slurry. Uh, especially in patients with multiple trauma where you expect diffuse areas of bleeding in multiple areas. If you think there's going to be a small area of bleeding or like a laceration, you can look at coils. Now some patients will need both. Uh, covered stents people talk about, but in, in our practice I, I've never actually seen anybody attempt to get a covered stent out this far. So with a microcatheter, we get out very distal and we see this blush which is, uh, which you would imagine based you'd find based on a CT scan. And so this patient was treated with a combination of gel foam slurry and coils to take down the arterial flow. And uh, because of the dual supply, this area is going to survive because of the uh, portal venous flow to the area. So the question becomes, is it going to be gel foam slurry or is it going to be gel foam slurry and coils uh, or coils alone? In a multi-trauma patient, you're going to have multiple areas. And so if you see one area and you think you can take that one area down with coils alone, you can do that. But you have to be aware that sometimes at angiography you may miss things and if you do, they, you may take out the area in uh, say the posterior right lower lobe that's bleeding but they may have a late bleed from the area you don't see. So I'm a little bit more uh, commonly will use a gel foam in, in more of a non-selective approach. So depending on what you're looking at in terms of the, uh, what are the rules? Non-operative management for liver trauma can be successful in 80 to 100% of the time in terms of what type of liver grade, what type of liver injury you're looking at. And these are patients that are initially stable who may or may not need an angioembolization. And we know that when we add embolization, we can decrease the mortality. And decrease the mortality, sometimes we'll have more patients that will survive with a degree of morbidity. Now, in terms of the complications, we'll see uh, delayed bleeding in patients that have undergone non-operative management who may or may not have had angiography. 
if there are injuries to the biliary structures, they can have leaks, bilomas, or bioperitonitis. Uh, patients been to the operating theater who we then embolize can get uh, biliary strictures, uh, and they can go to necrosis and or, and or liver abscess. So with the, uh, the, the ability to decrease the need for these patients to go to the OR, uh, sometimes we end up with complications. And if you look historically, the rates are not that much different, but there is the radiologist's involvement in managing these complications. So in patients that have uh, liver necrosis, which then leads to an abscess or a bioloma, there are things that the radiologist can do to sort of help in that. So this is a patient that was taken straight to the angio, excuse me, taken straight to the OR, who continued to bleed, and who subsequently we took the angio and we gel foamed. And that patient did fine with a combination of operative management and interventional reality embolization and so we're looking at, at sort of a group of patients that are pre-selected to have a higher degree of injuries uh, in patients who uh, have worse damage to the liver that requires immediate operation and then angiography. So this is a, a CT scan of a patient who had a, a fairly significant grade four injury with what looks to be sort of a devascularization almost uh, of the right lower lobe. And so this patient was brought to angiography. And you see there's a blush uh, sort of headed out towards segment five and six and the right lower lobe. And so that was treated with the gel foam slurry and controlled the bleeding. And several days later, the patient developed a white count. Uh, and at CT, you see that there is uh, <clears throat> basically necrosis of that part of the liver with dots of air. And so this turned into uh, liver necrosis and abscess. And so this went to ultrasound guided uh, puncture and drainage and uh, catheter injection shows the outline of the lower portion of the, the liver there. So this was successfully managed with a combination of embolization and subsequent catheter drainage for the uh, biliary necrosis and infection. So while we have managed to decrease the mortality, there is some morbidity that's involved with these techniques. And uh, patients that have a bioloma, the uh, endoscopist can go down and place stents to try to speed the biliary drainage to, to help manage the bile leaks. And patients who have abscesses, they can go to uh, catheter drainage uh, although sometimes those patients will go straight back to the OR to have a uh, surgery, uh, a lobectomy. So let's um, take a moment and sort of switch directions and go to the other side of the abdomen where there's the spleen. So when we talk about non-operative management of splenic trauma, it's a little bit cleaner because if the patient has operative management, then the spleen is gone. And if they have non-operative management, they keep their spleen. So if they keep their spleen, it avoids, obviously, the process of having your spleen out. And also, it, it preserves the function, the immunologic function of the spleen in terms of its ability to protect against encapsulated organ infection as the patient progresses through the rest of their life. So when we talk about the 60% of patients with blunt splenic trauma um, that we can observe and some of those patients will go to angiography, some of them will, will need embolization. That's a major shift over the last 30 years and uh, compared to where we were in the 80s prior to CT, where these patients pretty much always went to surgical exploration. And the majority of those, I suppose, the spleens went in the bucket. So there are different uh, questions arise when we talk about splenic uh, non-operative management. The first is when they go to angiography, uh, angiography uh, has the, the ability to, de to detect active bleeding in some patients, although it's not 100%. And in our institution, we've actually started to move away from angiography as a diagnostic tool deciding when to do the embolization. Uh, splenic artery embolization, when added to non-operative management, has enabled successful splenic salvage rates of up to 98.5% in and, uh, and some studies and improved the management of patients with high-grade splenic injuries of three, four, and five, and enabling up to an 80% non-operative success rate in the high-grade injury patients. 
So when we talk about the uh, injury grade on CT, that information is sort of uh, gleaned from the trauma surgeon's uh, grading from what they see at operation. And that's not necessarily the best predictor of who's going to do who's going to need to have an embolization and who's going to do well or who's going to do poorly with non-operative management. Uh, through the years, the presence or absence of a blush uh, or sort of active bleeding, uh, either at CT or at angiography, it seems to be a better predictor of who's going to do well with embolization. So when we look at the CT, uh, this was studied a couple years ago, where we compared the CT sensitivity for bleeding to that seen at angiography, and we saw that for the active bleeding, the sensitivity was about 87%. For the non-bleeding vascular injuries, uh, fishless, if you will, the sensitivity of CT was much lower. And so the CT kind of underestimated the need for endovascular treatment in some of these patients if you were looking at blush, uh, evidence of bleeding or blush on CT. So our protocol is based uh, sort of a, a, a combination of things. So if a patient has a grade one or two injury, those patients are just well observed, and that pretty much is the end of it. If the patient has a grade three injury, and a grade three injury can be a grade one or two injury that gets upgraded if they have uh, a vascular blush, those patients we typically will see the next morning uh, if it's in the middle of the night, or we'll see them urgently if it's during the day, they'll have an angiogram, and the, the embolization will be at the discretion of the interventional radiologist. And patients that have a grade four or grade five uh, splenic injury diagnosed on CT, those patients go to urgent, or excuse me, emergent angiography, and they're treated with a main splenic artery embolization, plus or minus a more selective embolization. And that's because th we, we know that if a patient has a grade four or five, splenic injury, those patients, if they go to angiography and the angiogram is described as being negative, those patients have a good sense, a better chance of late rebleeding. So when we talk about complications for spleen uh, interventions, we look at the late rebleeding, we look at splenic infarctions and splenic abscess, and also we worry about pancreatitis. And so when we talk about the where and what we do in terms of the splenic embolization, the question becomes, well, where exactly do you embolize the spleen? Uh, do you embolize it proximal or distal? Uh, do you embolize it proximal or distal to what? And this cartoon shows sort of the various arteries that arise from the splenic artery and then go into the uh, pancreas. So the pros of proximal embolization are that you decrease the pressure head to the spleen and allow the pseudoaneurysms uh, to heal. The cons are that if you have active bleeding from the splenic parenchyma out of the uh, capsule of the spleen into the peritoneal space, then that likely will continue. Uh, if these patients have arteriovenous fistula, that's a, a risk factor for failure, because if they have a big fistula, those will typically get bigger and eventually lead to rupture. Um, there's also the possibility that you can embolize more of the splenic artery than you had intended, and that can lead to pancreatitis and abscess. Now we look at distalimization of pros so that it can stop the active bleeding uh, at the site of the bleeding, and it's, it's much more effective for arteriovenous fistula. The cons are that if you have the multi-injured spleen, you may have more areas that are injured than you actually identify in your angiography, and you may have late rebleeding from some of those sites that are not addressed with the distalimization. Also, when you have a dyslimization, there's uh, more of a chance to devascularize the spleen, which can lead to splenic infarction and potential abscess. So when we look at some of the evidence of how do we decide to do proximal or distal, there's no real good prospective study that looked at proximal versus distal. So we're really stuck with looking at the data from the different retrospective studies and sorting, sorting through how things have evolved in terms of the technology of embolization as it has progressed over the last 20 years. So back in the 90s, Sclafani and uh, Scalia down at, at Downstate per, put through uh, uh, 150 patients through the non-operative management mill, and they had a 98.5% splenic salvage rate, and that's never been equaled uh, in, in anything that I've ever seen published. And those were done with proximal splenic embolizations. A uh, study by Davis and all looked at patients that underwent distal embolization, and they had 26 patients with distal embolization, and they had six failures for a little bit better than 75% success rate. Um, 
a study from 2000s at our institution, or one of my uh, colleagues, a surgeon at uh, Han, looked at a, a multi-center review, and he looked at uh, patients that had uh, proximal, distal, and combined. And typically, if the patient has combined, uh, that means they have a distal limitation plus a proximal limitation, and those, that sort of speaks to the severity of the injury, because those patients typically get uh, a distal limitation and a proximal limitation if they have severe active bleeding and uh, they get uh, a more proximal. And so that sort of pre-selects out a very sick patient group. Now, if you look at the failure rate, it's 33% for the combined, um, 11 and 13 for the proximal and distal. So when we look in terms of the studies of proximal coil normalization, it's a little bit muddy because these patients uh, through the years with coil embolization, proximal embolization wasn't all that proximal. And uh, this is a case of pancreatitis in which the patient had quote unquote proximal coil embolization, but as you see the coil nest meanders all the way out into from here all the way out to here. So you know you have coils out into the second and tertiary branches uh, and that's really more of a distal, but this was be pegged as a a proximal. And with coils, when you embolize the splenic artery with coils, it's not uncommon to have the coils migrate and or launch off into uh, places where you had no intention of the embolization being. And that's uh, somewhat different because now we have different technology. Now if you embolize the entire distal splenic artery, uh, the tail of the pancreas supply will typically be compromised because that often is supplied by the caudal pancreatic branches and the distal tip of the pancreas sometimes is isolated from the uh, transverse pancreatic artery. So you can actually devascularize that little piece and uh, induce pancreatitis. So that's something that, that you, we, we do worry about with the excessive or a little bit aggressive uh, embolization of the distal pancreatic, excuse me, the distal uh, splenic artery. So as technology has gone forward, we have the advent of the amplats or plugs, and those you can pretty well control. You can put them exactly where you want. If you don't like it, you can move it around and uh, put it somewhere else. Uh, so with that technology, you can be very precise in placing the, the, uh, the blockage. So uh, we, t we typically would prefer a precise proximal immobilization uh, because most of the time we have multiple areas of spleen injury and that therefore you decrease the pressure, allow the spleen to heal, and we preserve, uh, reserve dyslimalization for times when we see active bleeding into the peritoneal space in angiography or in patients where we see a, a, a high flow AV fistula at the time of angiography. So that I'm going to sort of stop and I'll pass the mic back to Dr. Selby. Thank you. Thanks, Howard.